section forty seven of four and twenty fairy tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c appendix madame le prince de beaumont by james planchet jean le prince de beaumont was born at rouen in seventeen eleven and commenced her literary career in seventeen forty eight by the production of a romance called le triomphe de la verte shortly after which she came to england and resided in london for a considerable time occupying herself as a governess and in writing works for the instruction as well as the amusement of youth that which acquired the most popularity was le magazine de enfants in which appeared her abridgment of beauty and the beast and her original fairy tales she was twice married her first was an unfortunate union annulled almost immediately afterwards her second marriage took place in england but to a Frenchman, and in 1762 she returned to France for the benefit of her native heir. In 1768 she purchased a small estate, called Chanovi, and died in 1780. Her miscellaneous works amount to seventy volumes, but even Le Magazine d'Enfants is scarcely remembered in the present day, and the four short fairy tales which terminate this volume are with the abridgment of beauty and the beast the only effusions by which she is popularly known in england the best of them is prince desire and princess melone it is more like one of the good old breton stories pleasant short and with a sound morale prince sherry corrupted into prince cherry in our children's books exhibits the influence of the importations from the east but that it has so manifest a morale it might pass for a french alteration of an oriental tale the names of solomon and zelie would encourage the suspicion the widow and her two daughters la veuve et ses deux filles is better known by the title of blanche et vermilion under which it has been frequently printed and was also produced on the french stage by monsieur florden in march seventeen eighty one the moral of the story is declared by the fairy to be that excessively trite and commonplace axiom that happiness consists in content or in the words of the author the possession of things only that are necessary without wishing for more but the author forgot to show us that blanche was discontented it does not appear that she wished for superfluities or to be a great queen or that such an idea ever entered her head till the fairy promised her she should become one not to reward but to punish her for begrudging to give away her plums poor blanche is therefore made an unhappy queen her low birth renders her an object of contempt at court the king is a worthless person who neglects the innocent girl his passion induced him to place upon his throne and who is this mother of his children and at length the miserable wife exclaims that happiness is not to be found in magnificent palaces but in the innocent occupations of the country now this is foolish it is worse for it is false and injurious there is as much happiness in palaces and on thrones thank god as there is in cottages the occupations of a virtuous sovereign are as innocent as those of a husbandman while the power to do good existing with the will must make the balance of happiness greatly in favour of the former 
the cares of state are burdensome enough no doubt and the more conscientious the monarch the weightier the sense of responsibility but has the countryman no cares no sorrows no vices the legal occupations of all classes are innocent it is only kings and nobles who yield to temptations or the indulge in the evil prosperities of our common nature there has been too much of this fallacy infused into what are called moral stories and at the risk of being accused of breaking a butterfly on the wheel i have singled out this particular instance as blanche and the vermilion is to be found in almost every child's story-book that the author's intention was laudable i do not doubt but to read a wholesome lesson she should have shown blanche to have been discontented with the lot assigned to her by providence pining to mix in society for which she was neither fitted by birth nor education and dreaming that happiness consisted solely in rank wealth and luxury the moral should have been not that such possessions were incompatible with virtue and happiness but that their owners were not exempted from the fragilities and sufferings of humanity and that unequal marriages were rarely fortunate ones all this it will be said she might mean but it is not evident and the only impression made upon a child's mind by this story if any impressions can be made by it whatever is the very absurd and objectionable one that all kings and queens are wicked and unhappy and all farmers and dairymaids virtuous and contented prince fatal and prince fortune this is another of the moral fairy tales of madame de maumont and as fatal and fortune a great favorite with the compilers of children's story-books it is healthier in tone than the preceding the value of adversity is difficult to impress on a young mind and is pointed out in this little tale as well perhaps as it could be but there is one observation i must venture to make in reference to a point of taste the writers of the old fairy tales never mix up the almighty with fairies and enchanters the superior powers are invariably the mythological divinities of ancient greece and rome their heroes and heroines pray to the gods not to god the introduction of the sacred name is i am well aware too frequent in familiar french conversation to render it a matter of criticism in the original language and i fully acquit madame de beaumont of any intentional irreverence but it is a fact worthy of remark that in an age and at a court where are described as particular licenses the writers for youth or entertainment carefully abstained from an unnecessary profanity of which they had examples enough in the older fabello and romances not only of their own country but throughout europe and that although the majority of these authors were in the highest ranks of society members of the circle that surrounded the throne of one of the most despotic monarchs in the civilized world they never spared the foibles or the crimes of princes or the hypocrisy and treachery of their parasites the fearless frankness indeed with which they satirized the follies and invited against the vices of the great is as honorable to them as their perfect freedom from that questionable morality which would deny in any class the existence of virtue and the enjoyment of happiness found upon it madame de beaumont's admission that such may be the case concludes her story of fatale and fortune more satisfactory than her insinuation to the contrary does that of the widow and her two daughters so much has been said in this appendix about poe d'anne 
an ledroit princess that although as in the case of prince marcusin and le dauphin in my former volume i have not included them in the body of the work i think it may be as well as in the above instance to give in this place an analysis of their plots they being undoubtedly two of the oldest fairy tales of their class on record po de anne a princess in order to escape the persecution of the king her father on a point of conscience consults a fairy who is her godmother and by her advice successfully requests her father to give her three dresses the first of the color of the sky the second of the color of the moon and the third of the color of the sun believing he will be unable to fulfill his promises he succeeds however in procuring for her the three dresses and she is then instructed to ask him for the skin of a marvellous ass in the royal stables which supplies the king daily with an ample quantity of gold coin under the impression that his majesty will never consent to such a sacrifice the infatuated monarch however does cause the ass to be killed and flayed and the princess on the receipt of the skin she has requested is reduced to flight the fairy tells her to put the three fine dresses and all her jewelry etc in a large trunk which by magical power is to follow her underground and appear whenever she needs it and begriming her face and hands and wrapping herself up in the ass's skin the princess escapes from the palace and travels into the dominions of a neighboring monarch she there obtains employment in a farm as a scullion and keeper of the pigs and poultry her only pleasure consisting in occasionally locking herself up in her miserable room and putting on her fine dresses and jewelry which appear at her wish as the fairy promised her the son of the king of this country happens to visit this farm occasionally as he returns from hunting and one day peeps through the keyhole of the door and sees po de anne as the princess is called from the only dress she wears in public arrayed in one of her richest robes he is dazzled with her beauty and believing her to be some divinity he is afraid to burst open the door and returns to the palace where he falls perfectly love-sick refusing to eat drink or take any amusement he inquires who lives in that wretched room at the farm and is told an ugly dirty kitchen wrench called po de anne for the reason aforesaid he declares that nothing can cure him but a cake made by her hands after all sorts of expulsations they yield to his wishes and po de anne is ordered to make a cake for the prince she has seen him on his visits to the farm and is equally in love with him she makes the cake and drops by accident or design a magnificent emerald ring into it the prince devours the cake and finds the ring he immediately declares that he will marry no one but the woman who owns that ring on this determination being made public all the unmarried ladies in the court and kingdom endeavor to fit on the ring but it is too small for any one to pretend to the ownership at length po de anne is sent for at the prince's wish and dropping her hideous ass's skin appears in magnificent attire and places the ring easily on her finger every one is astonished and the prince and her parents delighted and the nuptials take place being honored by the presence of kings and fairies from all quarters and specially by the father of the princess who has recovered from his infatuation the story founded originally on the legend of saint depine was a favorite in france from an exceedingly early period and was versified by perrault 
and published with Le Sohit's ridicule, as I have already stated, in 1694. He alludes to the original nursery tale in his Parallel de Ancien et de Moderne in 1689, in which he makes the Parisian of the ancients say, Le fable Melusine sont si putril que cette leur fait assez de honneur que de leur opposer no compte de peu de an et de la mer de oi the prose version of this tale was not published until many years after his death and is supposed by baron walkner not to have been his composition and i think there is a point unnoticed by the baron which supports that opinion the story is dedicated to mademoiselle eleanor de Lubert. now if this be mademoiselle de Lubert, author of la princesse camion etc she was not born till some years after the death of perrault and as in the dedication we find the lines qui oni voi soyi la auteur de prétent de vos jeunes ans the dedication itself could not have been written much before 1720 mademoiselle de Lubert having been born about 1710 there is another story in the conte aux joyeux de vise de bonaventure disparier novel one thirty of a young girl named po de anne and how she got married by the means furnished her by the aunts a gentleman fell in love with a merchant's daughter named pernet the father and mother not daring flatly to refuse their consent attached to it what they considered an impossible condition namely that for a given period previous to her marriage the girl should wear no other apparel than the skin of an ass pernet returning the gentleman's affection was not to be discouraged by this obstacle and cheerfully wore the skin of an ass for the appointed time foiled in this manner they set their wits to work to invent something more impracticable they insisted that she should lick up grain by grain a bushel of barley which they split for that purpose on the ground nothing daunted she applied herself to this task but the ants repaired to the same spot and took away all the barley by degrees without being noticed so that it appeared as if pernet had done it and her parents considered further opposition useless the girl obtained her husband the story concludes with the assertion that vrai et coutant qu'elle vescut le sobriant de peau de anne louis de mera there is nothing whatever in this story to remind one of the last beyond the simple circumstance of the skin nor have we any clue as to which may be the oldest but both were called peau de anne and it may be just possible that one furnished a hint for the other or indeed that there was a collection of stories so entitled for la part the valet of louis the fourteenth tells us in his memories that when that monarch was still a child but had passed from the hands of females into those of men he could not go to sleep pourquoi on le louis content pour les contes de peau de anne ainsi que la femme qui le gardient a variant costume de la fair le droit princesse ou les aventures de finette a king departing for the crusades commits to a fairy the charge of his three daughters nonchalant bilbared and finette names descriptive of their characters they are shut up in a tower without a door and furnished with three enchanted distaffs of glass which they are told will break on the 
commission of any indiscretion. They were to be provided with everything they might properly require by means of a basket let up and down by a crane and pulley fixed on the top of the tower. The two eldest princesses soon became weary of solitude, and one day pull up in the basket an old beggar woman, nonchalant hoping she will be her servant, and Babillard being anxious to have somebody else to talk to. The beggar woman proves to be a prince disguised, the son of a neighboring king, who is a bitter enemy of the father of the three princesses, and who has had recourse to this expedient in order to revenge himself for some insult or injury he has sustained. By flattering the foibles of the two princesses who introduced him into the tower, he succeeds in causing them to break both their distaffs, but all his artifices are foiled by Finette, the adroit princess, who gets rid of him by making him fall through a trap-door into the ditch under the tower. Enraged at his defeat, he has recourse to another scheme, and succeeds in inducing Finette to descend in the basket to procure assistance for her sisters, who are suffering from the consequences of their indiscretions. He seizes Finette, and is about to have her roll down a precipice in a tub filled with spikes, when she adroitly flings him into it and he suffers the fate he had projected for the princess. Mortally hurt, he bequeaths his vengeance to his brother, who swears to him that he will marry Finette, and murder her on the night of his nuptials. She, however, places a figure of straw in the bed, which the prince unwillingly stabs, and is only too delighted to find he is not guilty of murdering a woman he loves and who becomes his happy queen. This story was not published till 1742, when it was printed as Perrault's, although it was well known that Mademoiselle Le Hartier, who had read Perrault's Histoire de Temps Passé in manuscript, had conceived from them the idea of trying her hand at the same sort of composition, and had actually published in 1695-6, to six, this very story, under the title of Les Aventures de Finette, in her Livre Mesle, with a letter to the daughter of Perrault. Speaking of that very story, she says, Vous savez que dans le conte de Finette, les deux sœurs sont très éloquées d'être aussi vertueuses que je le fais en le par point de marriage que sont du indigné personne de qui en raconte de fabuleuses odieuses avec les circonstances chocottes and she also observes j'ai pour moi la tradition qui met ce conte de finette au temps de croissades there cannot surely be more evidence required to refute the assertion of Mr. Dunlop that Landroit Princess, be it written by Perrault or Mademoiselle Le Hetier, is taken from Le Pentamoron with little variation of machinery or incident. The story he alludes to is the fourth of the third day, and is entitled Sapia Licardia. There is no such name as Finette in it, and is well known independently of Mademoiselle Le Hertier's declaration that Le Conte de Finette was one of the oldest of the French nursery tales. Nor can we desire cleaner evidence of the way in which these stories were written than that which is afforded to us by the repeated acknowledgments of Mademoiselle Le Hertier. Si que je viens de vous dire, et toujours au fond bien navement, 
tell qu'on ma conte quand j'étais enfant and again sent for ma nourrice en ma nuit mon aunt fait ce beau récit près de tesson je n'ai fait qu'ajouter un peu de broderie let any one compare these lines with these of the concluding portion of the story of l'endroit princesse commencing voila madame etc and they must be struck by the singular resemblance there will be many general readers and perhaps some critics who may think i have been unnecessarily minute in my notes and humble attempts at illustration but whilst i feel that the fairy tales i have selected contain in themselves nothing that may not afford innocent entertainment to children i certainly hope that the little information i have been able to collect respecting some hitherto obscure and disputed points may give both this and the book that proceed preceded it an interest in the eyes of elder readers who may meet where they least expect it some fact or suggestion trifling in itself but furnishing a clue to more important matter my principal object has been however in this volume to disabuse the minds of those who have taken for granted the assertions of our historians of fiction concerning the original sources from whence perrault and madame de aulnoy in particular derived the plots of their fairy tales assertions which i confess i had not thought necessary to notice until in a kind of and complimentary review of my former volume it was publicly regretted as an opinion as an omission i trust i have now made it perfectly clear that whether or not the writers of those tales were cognizant of the existence of the collections of straparola and basil of some half-dozen meagre and garbled versions of stories told for ages in all the tongues of europe and asia that the real foundation of those of perrault were the old breton contes de la ma mere de oi which in company de peu de anne et de fier de la brasse et la saint autre vieux fatras he had heard in his own nursery and with louis the fourteenth had been rocked to sleep when a child as well as all the rest of the children in his dominions and that madame de aulnoy when not indebted to similar recollections drew upon her own fertile and lively imagination introducing occasionally an incident from one of the old trouveurs de l'anduc or some of those oriental stories which were circulated in manuscript long before their publication by galland or picked up by herself during her residence in spain from the moorish and turkish slaves around her nay from her own little servant zayed who though she could speak no language but her own at the time her mistress so pleasantly describes her might have eventually acquired sufficient french or spanish for such a purpose her account of this child is so interesting that i shall not apologize for quoting it they have here great numbers of slaves who are bought and sold at high prices they are moors and turks some of them worth four or five hundred crowns apiece you are extremely well served by these unhappy wretches they are far more diligent laborious and humble than other servants i have one that is not above nine years old she is as black as jet and would be reckoned in her own country a wonderful beauty for her nose is quite flat her lips prodigiously thick her eyes of red and white colour and her teeth admirable in europe as well in africa she understands not a word of any language than her own her name is zadeh 
we have got her baptized those who sold her to me said she was a girl of quality and the poor child will come often and fall down on her knees before me clasp her hands cry and point towards her country i would be willing to send her thither if she could there be a christian but this impossibility obliges me to keep her i would fain understand her for i believe her to be intelligent all her actions show it she dances after her fashion and so pleasantly that she affords us much entertainment i make her wear white patches with which she is mightily taken she is dressed as they are in morocco that is in a short gown almost without any plates large shift sleeves of fine cloth striped with different colors like those of our bohemians and gypsies a pair of stays made of merely a strip of crimson velvet on a gold ground and fastened at the sides with silver buckles and buttons and mantle of exceedingly fine woolen stuff very long and very large in which she wraps herself and with one corner of it covers her head this dress is very handsome her short hair which looks like wool is cut in several places on each side like a half moon on the crown in a circle and in front like a heart she cost me twenty pistoles my daughter has made her governess of her marmoset the little monkey given to her by the archbishop of burgos i assure you zade and the marmoset are capitally matched and understand each other extremely well relation du voyage en espagne with this characteristic and suggestive extract from a book deserving to be better known i leave a subject to which it is not likely i shall return in print though it will never cease to interest me in the study end of section 47 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc End of Four and Twenty Fairy Tales by Various Translated by James Planchet